You're listening to the Falconry Podcast with John Griggs and Ben Woodruff. Hello, I'm Ben Woodruff. And I'm John Griggs. And you're here with us today with the Falconry Podcast. Uh, it's been a while since we've done one of these. We had a lot of uh, upheaval in our lives and uh, both lived to tell the tale. We're happy to be here back. Uh, we put out a questionnaire asking what format you would like, and the bulk of you said that you would like this format with the videos. So we're giving it a try. Let us know what you think. But uh, John, you tell people about your channel and what you do. Yeah, I run a channel called Falcon's Ledge, and it's on this channel I review flight sim and space sim hardware. I do a bit of flight videos, but I also occasionally post falconry hunting videos. If you like aviation, flight sims, space sims, come and check it out. A link is in the video description down below. If you're interested in falconry videos, I also do a vlog on TikTok under the same name. So everybody, check out John's video and his TikTok account and his YouTube channel and uh, give him some love. And uh, we're excited to be here. Again, we are two passionate friends who uh, love falconry, love aviation, and both have raging ADHD. So <laughs> um, we've both been practicing this sport for a while. So we love to teach. We love to share, pass on what we've learned and what was taught to us. We also are opinionated in an open-minded way. If you know ADHD, it's like, blah, 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 blah. we want to <laughs> share, we want to talk, we want to... And so John and I love shooting the bull, talking about ideas, brainstorming. And falconers are among the most uh, opinionated group of humans on the planet. That's okay. If you have an opinion radically different than the things we talk about in today's video, it's fine. Share it in the comments. We'd love to hear it. Uh, we're not saying anything we're saying is right or wrong. We're just sharing our passion. So, uh, John, what are we talking about today? What's uh, what's our topic? We're talking about hybrids, and especially the hybrids that we're really interested in. That's right. So, uh, if you're new to the sport of falconry, there's all these amazing species of raptors. Uh, but uh, since the 1970s, uh, captive bred hybrid raptors have happened. Uh, there are Hybrid, there is hybridization that does occur in the wild with raptors, and I did a video a week or two ago on that. You can go back and see kind of the how that works, how and why. But uh, it's you generally recognized that the first uh, hybridization of captive bred raptors occurred in 1971 when falconers Ronald Stevens and John Morris in Ireland had a Sager falcon and a peregrine falcon that they were just flying as regular falconry birds and they put them up for the molt for the spring and summer, let them just uh, relax and chill out in the same chamber together. And lo and behold, they paired up, laid some eggs, and uh, and uh, they were fertile. And from there we have hybridization. Now, hybridizing in America, we do a lot with John and I are in the United States. There's a lot of hybrid falcons produced, but our laws are extremely strict here. In a lot of other countries, the laws are much looser or non-existent, which has allowed for more propagation and hybridizing and experimenting with new species. Because of that, we're kind of limited here, uh, but we still want to share kind of what we think are some of the most exciting possibilities with interesting species. Uh, and also, we got to kind of do a shout out for what uh, is, you know, some of the most effective ones. So, John, um, when it comes to long wings, to falcons, what... What would we go with is the first. What would be like the first biggie that is really prolifically seen in the sport of falconry? Boy, that's that's really got to be the Jir Peregrine. Mm. And, you know, there's a huge variety and a huge uh, or a huge variety of the amount of Jir that you have in it, the amount of Peregrine you have in it. And also, you know, the effectiveness of the bird isn't always the reasoning behind making a hybrid. Sometimes, of course, that's one benefit. I mean... It, I, in the in the best cases, you'd want to get the best features from both species. But in addition, sometimes it's looks or it's size. True. And in this particular case, jeer peregrines have an enormous variety, and they most of them seem to have kind of a similar performance, at least from what I've seen. But there's a lot of preference. Some people really like dark jeers mixed with dark peregrines or white mm -hmm. jeers with lighter peregrines to get the, a lighter overall look or or whatever um either and, way and you get a huge variety and a huge variance you, you really do i mean peregrines are a nearly worldwide species and so the size and colorations vary in jeers you can be pure black pure white and everything in between um some people give a lot of crap about that they're like oh 
why would you care so much about the looks of a bird? It's like, I'm an artist. I'm inspired by the beauty of some of these birds, purebred species or hybrids. It's part of why I do it. It's just like, whoa, they're just gorgeous. So, um, but I think the biggie with a jeer peregrine, especially in the United States, uh, a peregrine falcon is a perfect bird. You can't improve on it in theory. That's kind of my opinion, right? Peregrines, they're fast. They're loyal. They go up pretty fast. They dive incredibly fast. They're hard hitters. They're effective game hawks. But um, a jeer falcon, I, this is kind of uh, how I understand why they originally jeer peregrines became so famous and so popular. Uh, a jeer falcon should be the perfect sage grouse hunting bird, a male jeer falcon. They're the right size. They're the right power. They can get up faster than a peregrine can. They can, you know, peregrines, and the jeers, wham, wham, and they're up. No, so, it's because of wing loading. I mean, the jeers yeah. have much lower wing loading because they have broader wings. They do. Yeah. And they've just, the musculature is insane. That's yeah. why jeer falcons are often just tail chasing their prey when they could just speed up a little more and get them. But they're like, no, nah, just chase until you tire out and then thump them. But if you can, in theory, get a peregrine falcon, but that it's bigger, it can hit a little harder. And it can get up faster and is more loyal than jeer falcons, which are prone to self-hunt. That, uh, that's why a lot of, uh, especially sage grouse hunters, uh, go with jeer peregrines. But, I mean, they've proven themselves. They, For sure. they definitely have. And the, the varieties are endless. So, And you brought up a point I didn't even think about, which is you can have uh, half peregrine, half jeer. Or you can be like, and we're going to take one of those and cross it with a peregrine. So it's three-quarter jeer, one-quarter peregrine. One sixteenth peregrine, three, you know, six, fifteen, sixteenth. You know, you can just do all these other levels. So it's kind of and, neat, and that's mm -hmm. enabled because of the fact that uh, peregrines and jeers are obviously fairly close in their genetics, and so sometimes, mm -hmm. or I don't know what the percentage is. Um, if you know, comment in the comment section. But some of them, the offspring are fertile, but all hybrids are not that way. In fact, from what I understand, again, correct me if I'm wrong. Most hybrids are sterile, or or there or can at be least, a hybrid. Yeah. Yeah, there's some there's sometimes too. It depends on the gender, even from the same clutch. You could have the yeah. same mom and same dad, and maybe the females are more able to reproduce than the males from the same clutch, or vice versa. Uh, I haven't done person. I've flown hybrids, but I haven't bred any, so I don't know. I've been told that like you but yeah, but yeah. i've been told that and and uh, and read that but then again you know the people that i've heard it from may have been referring to hybrids that are of more differing species than jeers and peregrines for example so mm. and, and even then i think the most the most prolific hybrids are jeer peregrines and they may have a higher uh, success rate in terms of their um, virility mm -hmm. They're good birds, though. They've definitely proven themselves, and they've proven them to be popular enough that in the U.S. market, they're fairly accessible and reasonably priced. They're not cheap, but they're not astronomical. It's almost always pricier to get a pure jeer than a jeer peregrine. So you're, you're getting, in theory, the good attributes of a jeer at a better price. Yeah, and that really could really boil down to availability, you know, cost... Uh, cost goes down as um, as the uh, supply goes up. So mm -hmm. if there's True. there's a larger supply of jeer peregrines because you know lots of people are breeding them, so they're cheaper than say straight jeers because pe less people are probably breeding them. That's my my thought anyway. That makes it's sense. probably what's going on. That makes sense, and it's 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 expensive to breed birds. Yeah, P few people make money off of it. So as you and I well know, since that's where you know we're investigating that. So yeah. Well, the next bird then uh, is uh, not one that has been proven, one that would be very weird. Some people have made these, but it is a bird that uh, I have a, find would have a lot of value, and we'll explain our reasoning behind it. But first we have to say, if you're new to falconry, the Harris hawk, and I know in the books it's Harris's hawk. I don't care. It's a common name. <laughs> the fact that I'm saying it wrong. If I was saying the scientific name wrong, correct me. But I acknowledge it's Harris's hawk, not Harris hawk. Whatever. I won't I'm say from, it, Ben. I won't say it like that. I, I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I just, something in me. And you know what? There's old timers that are the same way. I have just amazing falconers that are mentors of mine that are old 
that still call kestrels sparrowhawks. And it's like, they're not a sparrowhawk. A sparrowhawk is a type of a sipper, but they can't break that either. Eh, it's all good. They call it a sparrowhawk. Fine. I but, usually uh, try to be very technical with my with my language and, and try to pronounce things properly. It's just something that I've always just kind of been a little bit picky at, but mm -hmm. I just can't do it. It's Harris Hawk. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a strange one, but that's all good. But Harris Hawks <laughs> are um, social. They are some of the best uh, birds used in falconry. They're a fairly recent, fairly recent addition to the sport. But Harris's are pack hunters, which is very unusual. And it makes them easier to train and easier to work with people. And you can also get many of them and hunt them together in a pack. Uh, their feathers are resilient. They don't, they don't break easily. But they're, they're uh, very fast, very good hunters. I've flown many of them. I love them. Uh, there's very few things you could say that are negative about them. So the this hybrid that I'm mentioning is the Harris Hawk Red-Tailed Hawk Hybrid. And it is a bird that I would love to fly. I have seen them made. I've never flown one. Uh, it's pretty rare for anybody to try to make one. And most people would say, why are you doing that? Why are you? <laughs> why would why you want to ruin a perfect bird? <laughs> mm -hmm. You can't, you know, Harris Hawk is fine. Why would you do that? But cue um, the Harris and red tail purists out there. Yeah. yeah they're like, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> we, we live in a weird place in Utah too. We have a very diverse range of landscapes of biomes and ecosystems. A lot of States it's like, okay, you're basically a hardwood forest or you're basically prairie or you're basic, whatever. Right. You know what I'm saying? You're desert. Yeah, you got your squirrel hawkers over here, and then mm -hmm. you've got your rabbit hawkers over here, and then sometimes somewhere in the middle you got all your duck hawkers for both of those birds. Yeah. Or in some states where you're you're crawling with jacks, like in Arizona, which is what we we did, uh, you know, you you hunt jacks with your Harrises because it's what you got available to you. What's there? And they're a heck of a challenge and a lot of fun. Yeah. Where Utah, you could be hunting cottontail rabbits, white-tailed jackrabbits, black-tailed jackrabbits, snowshoe hares. You could be hunting ducks and pheasants and quail. You could be, there's, there's a wide range. You could be going after kangaroo rats at night. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy things you can do here. High mountains, low mountains, uh, high desert, low deserts, prairies, marshlands, you name it. We have it. And so for me, it gets pretty cold here in the winter. Harris hawks do not do well in the cold. I still fly them in the winter. But to me, if you took the bulkier size, strength, and power to just like hit like a bowling ball, hit like a cinder block of a red-tailed hawk with its ability to handle the cold, and you combine that with the speed, agility, feather integrity, and uh, good nature of a Harris, that would be a great bird to fly. I that just I just to me that would be. And for somebody to say, well, just fly a Harris, fine. But I would definitely like to fly a Harris red tail. I don't know if you'd ever fly one. I think it's a cool idea. Maybe. I mean, I'm one of those few that has really never considered a red tail. When I started into falconry, I wanted to do long wings. And that was all that I was interested in, if you recall. Yes. But, uh, you know, moving down to Arizona, well, I had, didn't have long wing query not so much anyway i'd have to drive yeah, for a while to get at, to them. yeah yeah but i had rabbits so cue the harris hawk when got one of those started rabbit rabbit hunting still got to do the falconry and that was what i was really into um but you know i i think that that uh, you know your goal is always to get the best traits out of both species so there's mm -hmm. certainly positives that can come from both of those uh so i could really see their value um, who knows what it's going to look like? You never know <laughs> which which one's got stronger genetics. Which which um, it depends. Which is going to come through? You oh, never it know. Depends. Which is part of the fun too. I mean, I mean, if we're really honest, we are dopamine seeking um, simians. I mean, our our whole motivations. That, that's why we're all addicted to our phones, right? Is because they give you a constant dopamine hit if you're just scrolling through Instagram or whatever. That'll be dated. Someday Instagram won't exist and somebody will be looking at these videos 30 years ago from now. They'll be like, Instagram? What? Oh, old bogey. Uh, What's it, this business it, about? It's really <laughs> but, it, but it's really true. And so part of it is kind of the gamble. If you, you know, you get a hybrid, ooh, what's it going to, what's it going to be like? Which genetics are going to go through? And that's part of the fun of it, honestly. So um, I guess that'll be about it for Harris Redtail to me. 
Uh, it's a pretty straightforward hybrid. Um, I know they have been made. I've seen photos mostly in Europe of people who've done it. But uh, um, what's what'll be another good one? Well, I, one that I've always kind of wanted to see, uh, especially in later years when I've started to get into exhibitors, mm -hmm. it's got to be, and this is going to piss off again, the purists. We're going to use the Harris again because, well, quite frankly, the Harris is one of the best falconry birds available, mm -hmm. even though, you know, it doesn't make the top of my list on ones I'd want to fly. It still has the, the temperament that makes it a wonderful companion. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is certainly something that we're attracted to. Look at the other animals that we tend to pal around with. Dogs, cats, both of them are more on the affectionate side, right? Mm -hmm. So that's probably one of the things that draws us towards Harris's. But on the other end of the spectrum, you've got exhibitors, which have, let's just say, less social behaviors, right? So... Mm -hmm. I always thought that a Harris and Goss combination would be uh, cool. So now you got Goss people like, why would you want to ruin a perfect hunting bird or whatever? <laughs> and then the Harris people, why would you want to? Yeah, anyway. Well, it's the same reason why we would want to create any hybridization. We mm -hmm. want the positives from the Harris and the positives from the Goss. Now, again, we don't know. I mean, there it has been done. I've seen some pictures and... Each one seems to kind of look different to me, so I, I don't different. really. Same I don't thing, know I've seen which some one. Cooper's Harris's, and each one yeah. you're like, that's the same hybrid, but yeah. Yeah. So who knows? I mean, like I said, these hybrids oftentimes have to be tried a bunch of times in order to get the results that we look for. You can't always be lucky, like they probably did with the Gear Peregrines, because I've mm -hmm. seen a large number of those be super successful. Yes. And, you know, it just might be that that particular hybridization has a lot of upsides, right? Mm -hmm. So who knows if somebody's going to create a Goss-Harris cross that would have most of the upsides of those two species without some of the downsides, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and well, you were even thinking about lot. some, right? Some, some of yeah, the upsides. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of good, like... What, there, there's the big ones, of course, uh, and again, don't shoot me, not you, but everybody <laughs> listening to this. I love Harris's. I have flown a bunch of them. I love them. I have not flown them in a pack like other people have, but I've gone out field. It's just, it's, they're incredible. So they're amazing birds, but I don't mean this 100%, but think about this. You've heard the term jack of all trades, master of none. That's kind Swiss of Army knife. Harris, Swiss yeah. Army knife effect is what I call yeah. that. Yep. Harris hawks are fast not the fastest they're agile they're not the most agile they are you know they're all these things they're r really good but they're not one where everything else is like whoa they're up here and they're here like a jeer falcon is huge and so fast and they self hunt and go tail chase for a whole county and you lose them before sunset okay um and a lot of birds are like that they are really good here and really bad here harris's are not that way they're just kind of hey really pretty good at everything so a goshawk is one of arguably the best per direct pursuit hunting birds there is they can just go and go and go <clears throat> super fast but you got all these issues like a goshawk has usually you ha they're very high strung uh weight management you have to be far more precise with than with the harris they are prone to aggression. They are prone to not forgive if you do a training technique wrong and they'll hold a grudge forever. And their feathers suck. Their feathers are it's pretty so much all occipiters, right? Yeah. All occipiters. I don't know why, but even if you're training them right, it is hard to keep an occipiter feather perfect. And, and if you do, if you have feather perfect occipiters, you know, congratulations, first yeah. of all. Um, well because boy, I've seen an enormous number of exhibitors with you know broken feathers. I've fought with that myself with mm -hmm. my Cooper's hawks and Sharpshin hawks. You know they're fearless. They crash bushes and and it, it seems like their feathers they're so flexible and then they're not. And, and I don't. Then know the why. shaft is broken and yeah. there's a problem. So yeah, I, I, I've been. I there. don't know what the deal is with because okay, there are people who don't fly them. Who will say, oh, well, you're using equipment wrong or you're transporting them wrong. It's like, okay, that Maybe. happens with all birds. But I have, for, I guarantee I've had, I remember my first Cooper's Hawk and my first attempt and she went after something and she caught a quail. And as she turned and caught it and drug with it, she, she caught.
caught she broke a feather tail feather and i just remember thinking i didn't do anything wrong she was hunting a quail they hung quail in the wild there's nothing that i did differently what what's so they have brittle feathers they have they have issues sometimes with aggression there it's a very extremely high maintenance bird where harris is anything but that so again the idea is in theory if you cross a goss with a harris the hope is you have a Harris Hawk that's even faster, even more agile, has more energy, but is more mellow, more easygoing, doesn't need as tight of weight management, and the feathers don't break. I mean, I'll tell you, when I have a Goss Hawk break a tail feather, I imp it and replace it with a Harris Hawk tail. <laughs> I just, I'm like, I don't want to switch. I don't want to put an, a, a molted Goss tail on this broken Goss tail. I will put a Harris on because... Harris hawk tail feathers are indestructible. You're just like, boop, boop, bend them around, boing. Well, I can tell hawk. you one thing. You you know how I've been with my perch. Uh, Ben's been following my perch design since it. I really started iterating on it back when <laughs> I was. It was after my apprenticeship, you know, twenty some odd years ago. But um, I've been designing different perches for my birds and kind of experimenting with them as I go because I don't want to have these kinds of things happen. And <laughs> my Harris. It was kept on versions of that perch way before I even started with exhibitors. Mm -hmm. And they never broke a feather. I've never <laughs> had a Harris break a feather on mm -hmm. any of my perches, right? Me neither. So my exhibitors have been using the latest versions of this perch, that the perch design that I've been making. And they haven't been breaking them on the perch either. They've been breaking them while we're handling out and hunting and while hunting. Those are the only two times that I've ever had them break, but they do. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a real challenge. I think that most I think I had I had one Cooper's hawk that never broke a tail feather, never had an issue. But mm. the the other ones, they it was mostly crashing bush, fighting with uh with prey. That's when that's when the crap happens. When it happens, so, they're reckless. Yeah. And so if you could have some of that reckless hunting drive again with more resilient uh feathers of a higher integrity. It's, in theory, a good cross, and that is one that I would definitely fly. By the way, any of these that we are mentioning, <laughs> if you breed any of these, <laughs> reach out to us, because uh, both of us would love to... Uh, I mean, I've flown to your peregrines. That's that's not my style, so I'm not talking about those. But any of these others, if you breed any of those or know someone who does, reach out to us. Let us know in the comments, because uh, both of us would uh, love to uh, purchase and fly a captive bred version of one of these. Which goes yeah. to the next one, which you're probably never going to see in the States. I've only <laughs> known of this in Canada. Maybe Europe has done it. And that is... Yeah, here, here I can I can picture the people uh, firing shots across the bow at us now. If you really the, want to, you know, there's comment section for a reason. Uh, yeah, you know, give it like, to us. Go ahead. so wrong. <laughs> we, we respect your views, even if we don't agree with them. I value hearing them. John, I know you do too. It's like, okay, I want to hear your perspective. Why do you think so differently than I do? Who knows? This, you might convince us. I mean, I, you might. we're both pretty open when, in terms of mm -hmm. that stuff. And I am certainly not wrong. In fact, one of my favorite YouTubers has, has a, slogan, a, a slogan or motto that says, I never said I was good at this. That's what his <laughs> motto is, and I love it. And yeah. ever since I've heard it, I'm just like, you know, I'm going to say the same type of thing, man. I, I never said I was good at this. I just love it. <laughs> We're just loving it. We're just enjoying it. It's, just, it's fun to talk. It's fun to talk birds. Yeah. So this is a hybrid that I would I would kill to fly and honestly would be diverse. If you have – think of a diversity of hunting. If you have a bird that you're like, okay, it can hunt like, like a Cooper's. You can hunt sparrows all the way up. You can dance into the – range of a small pheasant or small a small ducks. rabbit right? yeah you're, you're kind of this is your range this is a bird that would start here and go all the way up here and that is a harris hawk crossed with a golden eagle you're gonna get hate you're gonna i'm get gonna hate. get lots yeah. of hate for yeah. it and they are <laughs> they're way smaller than you think now basically i view this as a man-made hawk eagle which actually is kind of stupid because Harris hawks seem to be an offshoot of Buteo gallus, which is actually a bunch of neotropical eagles that some of them have gone small. You know, great black hawk, common black hawk, montane solitary eagle, crested solitary eagle, that family line. So actually, a Harris hawk golden eagle hybrid is not a cross between a hawk and an eagle. It's a cross between an eagle and a 
very derived little eagle. But that's not the point. The point is they're actually smaller than you think. Golden eagles are built, uh, they can handle the cold. They live in desert regions too, but they're they're just, I'm a fortress of solitude against the cold. <laughs> they're just, they've got these booted legs, feathers all the way down to the tips of the toes. They are so powerful and they are fast. Golden eagles, even the females are fast. Um, they doesn't, when you're watching them flying, you see them flap, flap. And you're thinking when they're pursuing, you're like, oh, they're not going that fast. And then you see on where they're covering, you're like, oh, Every flap of a golden eagle really charging in is like five to seven flaps of a red-tailed hawk. So they're covering ground. They are agile when they want to be. They can hunt some amazing prey. But if you can take weight off of that and distribute it more like an occipiter, that's the Harris uh, hawk uh, golden eagle hybrid. You make them gangly underneath. And they're big, but they're way smaller than you think. It's like the perfect hawk eagle. A lot of people want to fly an ornate hawk eagle. That's uh, an amazing bird, too. But to me, I think this would be even better. It's like a man-made hawk eagle with tons of power, tons of sprint, uh, more social attitude like a Harris. I just think it's a great, amazing uh, hybrid. And I hope more of them get produced, even if it never happens in the States with our crazy laws. And, and I, keep in mind those traits that, that uh, we're mentioning on most of these. These are the desired traits um, mm -hmm. because some of these crosses really haven't been explored in extreme detail yet. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. But I mean, these are really the goals that you would do. And and from a size perspective, this is something that I've been noticing. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. Never said I was good at this. <laughs> um, most of the time when, when I see large species being bred with small species, um, the female of the species is usually the smaller one. And I think that that may have a result on how large it is because the females, they govern how large and small their eggs are. Correct. So that's going to have a lot of effect on how what the up, upper end of how big these birds are going to get. Um, maybe it can be done the other way around. Don't know. Kind of just starting our foray into understanding and researching uh, this uh, the breeding setup. So yeah. So 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 the, that concept, that idea is like, hey, if you're going to cross a Harris hawk and a golden eagle, if you want the hybrids, the offspring to be bigger have the female be the eagle. If you want them to be smaller, have the female be the Harris because the egg size and that is going to kind of s sort of build the, the framework for lack of a proper term of what the adult is going to look like. And, and, and that may be incorrect, but everything that I've been able to find that kind of explains that, th that was kind of what I was seeing. But if that's you what have... That's readers have told me too. Yeah. But again, that's just... If, you, experience if you have references where that isn't true, put them down in the comment sections, drop us a DM something, um, you know, let us know because this is something that's, that's kind of been fascinating to both Ben and I recently. So it's been something that we've been, uh, been exploring. Mm. Now there's uh, there's a lot of little falcons that uh, micro hawking we've talked about is uh, kind of going to be a way to the future. There's one micro falcon hybrid that has proven itself, uh, but it's a shame in America. Fair, it seems like this hybrid only happens when a breeder gets bored one year and decides to make them. So do you want to tell them about these? Yeah, this has got to be the Peregrine Merlin hybrid, the Perlin. Um, and I, I started to do some research on these just because I have an interest in them. I, you know, I have two, two Merlins right now having a lot of fun with them. Wish that the weather would be better because it, it's really bit, it's been a, a wild year. Yeah. It's, it's I really didn't want to get out hunting the birds, um, with bad weather, wind, stuff like that. And before storms, it gets really windy here in Twila. So mm -hmm. I, I've haven't done as much of it as I'd like to, but I'm really rip roar and ready to go and get them done anyway uh the perlin um it seems to land in between everything else right and it's one of those where it's a much larger species but with a small one so perlins as my understanding is 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 a slightly larger merlin they tend to want to go to a pitch like a peregrine but it's a shorter pitch which and, and this, I'll, I'll tell you why I have such an interest in this and why I chose this to be in this list of ones I've been really interested in is that I have a particular interest in urban hawking, not necessarily in the city per se. Mm. You probably could with pigeons, right? Yeah. But um, more hawking close to home. 
because I think that that has a has a uh, big factor in the future of falconry. Being mm-hmm. able to hunt close to your home, because you know a lot of us were putting even more and more work hours in. Um, we're oftentimes living in cities, not close to places where you can hunt. So I've been getting very interested in birds that can be successful not that far from home. Crossover and, birds. Yeah, you don't have to go to the to the next county to fly. And I've I've literally flown. I think I think I've flown every micro that's available to us in the United States from the wild. Mm-hmm. Uh, kestrels, sharpies, coopers, merlins. Uh, merlins, just a whole bunch of even even some Harris's get really small. Like there the Harris that I flew, so. the Cole? Harris that I flew, Cole was like yeah. three hundred something grams. He was not a big bird. He was very small, like a Cooper's hawk. Almost. Yeah, he was. He was really quick. Uh, he liked to flush things to me and not for, from me, but that'll, that's a story <laughs> from a different ta- time. But yeah, I think Perlins have some great features. Yeah, they may not be the best bird out there. Um, a lot of people that I've spoken to about Perlins have said, oh, well, just get a Barberry or something. And I'm like, well, no, I was thinking of making something a little bit more specific to hunting in close um, from a short pitch, something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, or being able to fly like a Merlin when needed, or like a Peregrine. I, I think they could be really versatile if if given the opportunity. And sometimes with with different hybrids and things, I think that the the problem that we make of these things is kind of a problem of our own creation. Mm-hmm. And that is, we make a <clears throat> Merlin. Let's say. I mean, this is totally hypothetical. I have not flown them yet. I plan to try them out, but. This is just something that could be. So we make a bird with specific intentions. That bird might not really be suited perfectly for that that uh, style. Maybe it is good for a completely different style. We haven't tried it in. That so, even neither neither parent has. See, I've right. flown two of them. Right. Uh, both were hand me downs, but one was a male, one was a female. And the male is everything you said. It was just like a cross between a peregrine and a you know, on a Merlin. And so you could do both. You could do a hunter from a pitch or, or, you know, hunt it where do you self hunting like flock hawking with Merlins. But the female was its own kind of Falcon. It was like a Falcon with the abilities of, of a goshawk. Uh, and I loved to chase pigeons off the fist that were even far away. I just go walk up or drive up, go to a farm or a, a cut cornfield and like way out there, half a mile, there's pigeons. And I done hood her and she'd, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you go in there and just, they wouldn't even get up they'd just be like two feet off the ground huh, bam it would just i'm like i have ne- I, I know sakers and jeers are supposed to be good at direct pursuit but this thing was just, it was like shooting a gun at a, at a pigeon it was incredible and i'm like why aren't people making these things like breeders please please could we have these i know merlins can be tricky with any aspect from purebreds to hybrids but still well even just the two merlins that i have right now i've, I've got my wife has a richardson's male and i have a, a suclei or a very dark columbaris i mean mm-hmm. the opinions will be split on that one i i think it's a, a black merlin um you know mainly because you know the striping on the chest and i i keep seeing this where the striping on the chest on columbaris or i think they call them also taiga ones but falconers don't usually use that term um the striping is separated so you have they're separated by lighter color right you'll see the a, a defined stripe and then it seems on the suclei those stripes kind of meld together into big splotches mm. that's what she's got anyway it, it's hard here nor to there. merlins are weird i did a, a video on the on the subspecies and the hard yeah. thing about them is that where the ranges cross over that they they kind of do polyamory where yeah. where males will go and breed with other females and then go back to their own mate with food like coopers uh, and sharpies yeah, to where, where just, you see see the same kind of polyamory where you'll see one male servicing four female nests right nests mm-hmm. with females in them and then you'll have one female with you know three male nests uh, yeah. uh males servicing that nest so it's it's and each egg is fertilized separately. It's not like puppies. Okay. So you yeah. See, have... I haven't. I, I don't know a whole lot about the Merlin side of that, but that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. So kind of kind of strange. What what the you know if it, is it just genetic diversity driving that? Don't know. But uh, it's be it's interesting because if you make a rule, nature will break it. 
So yeah. even if you try to look for, are the markings right for this subspecies? Yes, except for this one thing over here. Why can you know? And it turns out, oh, maybe it's because the dad was a different subspecies in the wild, and you didn't know. But well, you know, Apollo, he's you could you you trapped him. You actually have a video of that, and you showed it on your channel, and. Mm. Um, he ha he's definitely a Richardson's. I mean, you mm -hmm. can see that in oh, the yeah. head. The head has that really light, f uh, flushed out color to it. But the back, it's a little bit darker than some of the Richardson's that mm -hmm. I've seen. Some yeah. of the Richardson's are super tan. So, and and bringing this back to the the Perlin conversation, I think that when as we were talking about, and this this directly connects in with um with the subspecies, I really think that a dark Merlin or black Merlin Suclei would be neat to cross with a mm. peels peregrine oh, so you've got that yeah. dark really rich very uh strongly striped mm -hmm. bird but with the contrasting white chest you know I, i've always been had a thing yeah. for peels ask ben it's ever since i've i've been his apprentice 20 some odd years peels ago are good looking peregrines uh, I, that, i've always that's wanted the biggest one. <laughs> peregrine too and they're the darkest. Their first year, they're almost completely black on the back, most yeah. of them, and, and the chest, too. But then the next year, those uh, stripes on the chest are just way thicker. Not yeah. stripes, they're bars. They're so thick, they're bars. Yeah, they're the touching chest. each other. That's just what I was talking about. Oh. As as just you like get a... more melanin, it doesn't seem to spread this way. It seems to spread this way, and they connect together. And that's the same thing that I've just been observing with, with Merlins. This is not something I know for a matter of a fact. A fact. Mm. It's just a, something that I've been trapping them. So, I, you know, I've trapped eight or eight, I think, of them this year. Mm -hmm. And I've been noticing that the ones that are a little bit darker, <clears throat> those stripes on their chest, instead of being taller or longer, they're wider and they start to touch each other. as They, they bleed over. And the, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. Instead of just being bars and this is the gap in between, they start to circle on the edge and then eventually just fill in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's and all the, the same the, math. It's, there's a mathematical formula to it and it's amazing. Absolutely. And you're just like adding the amount of melanin crazy i've even wondered you know if if these two merlins bred you know what kind of babies would you get are they going to be a mix of some of the the morphs or are they going to be you know you have some of them they're dark and then some of them mm. they're white how does that exactly work because i'm sure because the ranges of these birds they cross over all over the place so how does that work in the wild I, i'm curious about that yeah yeah it warrants more research it, it definitely <laughs> does um the the um both of the Perlins I flew were an autumn peregrines, which are it's the one in the background. There's the picture behind us is an yeah. autumn peregrine, very red chest. Not all that big for a peregrine. Uh, crossed with uh, Richardson's Merlin, which is the largest the lightest. and the lightest. Yep. So you got a smaller peregrine with a large Merlin, both lights of their species. Um, loved them. But boy, if you could have a black Merlin cross with a Peel's peregrine, that that'd be quite a bird. That'd I'm hoping to get one. Steve, call me back if you watch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really would like to fly a, a Peel's Peregrine this year. But but yeah, that's that's the Perlin. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of other little falcons too, just to give quick mention. Um, and some of them just haven't fared well. I've flown a couple of black jeers crossed with black Merlins, with the, which you want to talk about beauty being a determining factor in getting a bird. Those birds were good, but it, they were just like the worst attributes of a jeer. Um, they would j j just weight management didn't matter. They just would kind of dink around. They didn't ever, you know, they it was pain to get them back no matter what the weight. You know, I've been f doing falconry for decades. It's not just like, hey, I can't get through. It's like, well, <laughs> drop them a few times. It wasn't that, trust me. Um, and I loved them. They're beautiful birds, fun to teach with, but man, they just, and, and most of the people who I have talked to have flown Jeer Merlins, it's just not, you know, not the greatest hybrid as far as productive use. Um, but there, there's a lot of little ones like that. The one that never did get made, I have to pay homage because I was at the top of his list every year and it never happened. Pete Jungman was trying to cross Tita Falcons with Merlins. <laughs> and that would have been one heck of a hybrid, both the coloration, the size, uh, and the power. It would have been just giving so much more power and hitting force uh, to a Merlin. You hope so, would, anyway. I mean, you assume, yeah. Yeah. One thing that I've noticed, because I've, I've looked at a lot of different hybrids, because, you know, 
as you start to research, you're, you get really curious about, well, what would this look like? And I've mm. seen things like, you know, ferruginous hawks crossed with Harris hawks. And mm -hmm. you, you don't always get the looks that you're expecting. So true. you never know. I think that you had mentioned one earlier about, you know, I always wanted to see this type of falcon mixed with another one. And Oh, yeah. Yeah. They never... yeah. Every Oplomato hybrid I've ever seen, it's kind of, like an Oplomato falcon is one of the most striking looking oh, birds yeah. on the planet. You're just like, Ugh. the mallard stripe, the stri they're just, they're just, wow. They just, they're neat. It's one of the few birds that'll catch your attention, even if you hate birds. Um, and I assumed when we started to get Peruvian uh, Oplomatos in the States here circulating among falconers, I've flown a couple, uh, and people started breeding them and started doing hybrids. I was excited. I'm like, oh, man, Peregrine Oplomato. I bet that's it. I bet that's the bird. Oh, you know. But I've seen Peregrine Oplomatos. I've seen Jer Oplomatos, and I'm kind of like, it's okay. They have so sure. much more of the other bird in them that, that hardly any of the Oplomato genetics come through. And it's just kind of like, eh, you know, yeah. I, if it's not going to inspire me visually or do anything amazing in its abilities, I, I'm, I, I almost always would rather fly a purebred species. I'm not into hybrids. So here we're talking about our dream hybrids, but I'm usually one to be like, no, it's your peregrine, give me a peregrine. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, wait till you get a load of a specific one. Yeah. <laughs> I we, don't should know. We, should we bring it up? Should yeah. we bring up our dream bird? Should we preface it? Should we put up shields and armor first before we bring this up? <laughs> yeah. It gets an outcry of anger at us. If, if any of the birds are really going to bring people out saying, yeah, that's going to be junk, that's probably going to be this one. But and we, we, we contend against what you're about to say. We still welcome your criticism, but we strongly contend against it and will defend. Yep. And that would be the Peregrine American Kestrel. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> or I've How heard it. How did they say it? I had such respect for them, but they, they uttered those words on the internet. It's out forever. Yeah, and uh, you know I've heard them called periax, and I kind of like the the term, so I'll, I'll probably just be calling them periax. But um, I think that there's this is kind of a twofold scenario as to why you would want to take a peregrine, which is already an amazing bird, perhaps even what some would consider perfection, um, and cross it with a kestrel. Where let's let's face it, kestrels are not exactly the strongest of flyers. Actually, I've American, we're talking about American kestrels here. We got a worldwide yeah. audience. No, American we're, we're kestrels specifically. And you did say that when you mentioned yes. the hybrid, but yep. everybody remember we're talking about American kestrels here. Yeah, and, and you know, at one time that was what I was even known at known for flying when I when I was in my apprenticeship and right after, um, I had a, an amazing bird named Isis that caught you know 500 plus. I stopped counting at about 500 mm -hmm. over over a two season run. Uh, the second season was a bit short, but yeah, it was it was two seasons and some days we'd bring home five. And she was just amazing. So I was thinking about, okay, so why would this hybridization be cool? Or could be cool, right? Same reason I talked about with the with the Perlin. And that is a peregrine that might have value in hunting a little closer to home. Dude, let's be you know? bolder. Let's be bolder. I we talk, Versatility. We're, being, we're, we're being diplomatic here. Yeah. We th the, the potential is there. We're going to back it up in a sec. But for the peregrine American kestrel hybrid to be the ultimate urban hawking bird. Yeah. Not it just could like, be. ah, it has the potential. I've talked to a number of people who have flown them on uh, on the internet. and Other side of the pond. Yep. Uh, yes, yeah, some of, one of them is down in South America. I haven't really asked them any of their permission, so I won't mention them. So, yeah, some of them are in Europe. Um, I've asked them about things like car hawking because, quite frankly, when you're talking about birds that are unprotected, like starlings and sparrows, I honestly think, and you know, controversial, yes, but I, I think car hawking is a lot of fun for them. So I, I like to have birds that can do that. I don't, I no longer want that because, you know, I'm in a lot better shape than I was a year ago. I no longer want that as a primary form of, of hawking. But if there's not a lot of time that I have in a day, I'd like to be able to just go out, drive down the street, let the bird go out after some starlings or something there's like a that. Flock, that lamb, go yeah. Get them. If you're just, if, <clears throat> if you're, just wanting to collect some additional food, great, do that. I but I think um, 
I think, it, again, it would be very versatile. These same people have told me that they've hot car hawked with them, that they've flown from a pitch, and that they've had direct pursuit flights. Mm. What else do you want besides a bird that can do all of those things? That's yeah. amazing to me. Now, is it is it a Swiss Army knife syndrome? Maybe. Could I don't be. think so. I think, I think they're just really, really good. I don't think it's like master of none. I think mm -hmm. the, they would mask be a master of some things because it's like a peregrine is usually the most dependable large falcon yeah. arguably right yeah um but they they are fast in in pursuit fast in a dive but they're very loyal very good to work with very predictable so is a kestrel very loyal very predictable but a kestrel in pursuit they're up on, on you know if they're in the wild they're up on a pole and they go diving after a bird if they miss they're like oh and they go land on the next pole right. instead of being like oh and go fly 10 miles right so if you get that closer to home this is one of the problems with the Merlin Peregrine, with the Perlin, is that a Merlin will go and go and go and go and go. So you like are a not, yeah. So you are not getting any of the hey, let's stay closer to home. We're in an urban environment where hopefully with a Kestrel Peregrine or the Periac, you would hopefully get some of the abilities of a Peregrine with an in-between size, but the bird itself is more prone to if it misses bank off and return and that might be not, not be desirable on certain on certain prey not. species but i mean in urban hawking generally speaking you don't want your bird to pursue forever you want your bird to go up to a perch and return to you or be ready for a reflush mm -hmm. uh, things like that thing in in all of the experience that i've had with urban hawking um you want that shorter shorter extension like this excipiters were good that way mm -hmm. usually when my cooper's hawk would go out after something it was going to make a pass at it maybe it would make a couple of passes in the bush uh maybe it would dive bush and then pop it was up to a roof or yeah. to a tree or something and ready for me to call to the lure and it's nice because on a failure a failure isn't turning into a telemetry chase most of the time it can it can um, I but flew, usually they're like pop up, yeah. reset, okay, get me instead of like I'm just gonna keep going forever and not get it, but be a county away. And ISIS would chase. Um, mm -hmm. We flushed ISIS on a group of starling and sparrow by the water treatment plant. If you remember, instead she's like, I want to take that kill deer, and I am not gonna give up until I have it. And she chased that thing three or four hundred yards before mm -hmm. it finally got away from her. Um, but yeah, that's. She did great, but still, three four hundred yards isn't bad. We flew. Yeah, that's a, that's a good chase. I flew ISIS for two years and never mm. had telemetry. At the time, I was you know poor pre college student um, <laughs> living in a one bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I didn't have telemetry. Didn't lose her. Now that's not saying that a periac can be flown without telemetry. As no, 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 no. Everyone that I know that is flying one, even though they're not in the United States and not held under some of the rules that some states have where you have to fly with two transmitters, um, you would, I would suspect you still have to use that. In fact, everyone everyone that I know does run telemetry on their on their uh, periac. And if you're spending the kind of money you're going to have to spend to get a to get a uh, hybrid, you're probably going to want to run that anyway, just uh -huh. as an invest investment protection. But absolutely, I think one of the coolest things about it, and this is not why I fly, right? I, I if you've never known me to 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 be very have a lot of vanity when it comes to my birds, it's all about how effective they are. But um, they're also pretty dang cool looking. I, I got to give it to them. There's, you know, the two main reasons we talked about this early, two main reasons to fly a hybrid one performance, mm -hmm. wanting to get a particular performance for what you want to do. Your peregrines on grouse and bigger quarry there. There's a reason why they're good. But secondly, people, people like the look, I think more than they're willing to admit. But they and got a they're, weird they're rule about their looks. They do. They do. And this is something a lot of people don't realize. The first year, they're going to be, you know, whatever. They're going to have, you know, a lot of brown in them. But yeah. male and female American kestrels uh, have sexually dimorphic colors. They the do. females are basically red with black bars on their back and on their tail and blue on the head. Uh, depending on where you live, there might be a red circle in that. And did I say females? That's females. I think I said females. And yeah, the males, mostly red, yeah. Yeah. And the males are going to have, uh, they'll have red in the center of their back, but when their wings are folded up, the rest of their wings are going to appear blue. Mm -hmm. And the tail's different. The tail's, uh, you know, red with black bar on the bottom. But um, 
Tell them about the weird thing, about what the hybrid looks like and why. Um, oftentimes the, and I've seen them both ways, right? So so there's there's variation in this. So if, if you have a Periac and yours is one of these ways or the other, please, you know, comment and let us know yeah. because because it's something that we're, we've been exploring and talking about. Um, most of the time after they adult into the, uh, molt into their adult feathers, most of the birds have blue wings no matter what, and oftentimes a blue tail. But again, there's variation in that because I've seen them where they'll have red on the back, but blue wings, but they're female. Mm. And, because you've got the... So in other words, no matter what male or female, they're kind of going to look like a big male kestrel. Yep. Uh, because peregrines, well, most peregrines, have blue, you know, yep. blue back, blue wings, blue tail. And so you might have red in the center, but the have the peregrine genes take over on the side parts of the folded wings, so it might look like a giant male kestrel and it actually be a female periac. Yeah. And I've Weird. seen I've seen both images and I don't always know cuz Ben would tell you I uh <laughs> he'll be he'll be doing whatever and all of a sudden get a, a picture with you know or a, a message with seven pictures of periacs and they're <laughs> like you know you want one. It's true. <laughs> and I don't really always know if they're uh, if they're adult or or uh juvenile so uh, but yes, I've seen them in, in both color patterns and I've even seen, I've, I remember seeing one where it had, it looked like a big female American kestrel mm. with a blue tail. It so was very weird. weird. So there's obviously some variation and that's actually something that really interests me. And Ben and I have been talking about possibly doing some breeding and not you and me, a breeding <laughs> project. Not uh, us. We have an announcement to make. It's kind you know, of impossible for us. To... <laughs> but a falconer loves a falconer very much. No, no. Uh, we're, doing we're doing a breeding about... project with with American kestrels and Peel's peregrines. So kind of bringing that um, darkness and richness of the Peel's peregrine and maybe the size. A little you, more size. Too, you, yeah. you never know. You never know how that's going to affect them since the female is still, theory. yeah, the, the female is still a an American kestrel. So, um, but yeah, getting that cross and, and exploring it and seeing what it can do. Mm. And, you know, if, if uh, people want them, that's great too. But really, I have to admit, this is, this is just to satisfy my own weird curiosities. <laughs> and more we than can't anything. get them. I don't know if anybody out there in the States breeds or is willing to breed uh an american kestrel peregrine hybrid no matter what the subspecies of peregrine let us know because both john and i would love to purchase and fly one and yeah. in addition to that we are trying to start a breeding project and that will be one of the aims we want yeah. to also breed peregrines and and maybe do merlins and uh, merlin peregrines too but because i think what well, we both talked about i mean urban urban and semi-urban hawking is kind of the future and if there was some perfect sized birds that didn't have drawbacks that could be a really good thing and who knows who knows what the end result will be whether or not they'll be ideal for the type of hawking that i that mm. i have available um if they are great then you know i'll sing their praises and and let you guys know but if they're terrible then you know i i don't have any problem saying so either so yeah it's like it's like uh, I, I I was honest about the black tier black merlins. I loved them. If somebody handed me one today, I would still take it and would still fly it. But I'm just saying they proved to be uh, tricky, problematic. Um, and everything we've heard about the peregrine kestrels has been good, good reports. Yep. Uh, they seem like fascinating birds with a lot of capability. And it's funny that people rip on the hybrid when... They don't rip on kestrels. Why would why, why, why would you do that? It's like kestrels are proving themselves. They're very capable hunters with very specific hunting styles. They do great. So if you are, here's the rule of hybrids, ladies and gentlemen, humans of the world. Here's the rule: anything you put peregrine into makes it better. <laughs> Generally kind of speaking, a, you might be like, <laughs> no, you're wrong. Fine, there's maybe there's specific examples, but the general rule is if you put peregrine into any hybrid, it's going to improve it. Well, Ben, my 
my peregrine northern harrier didn't turn out well at all. <laughs> What's your problem? Why didn't it? Oh, it kept running into walls and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, that that's the truth. I And again, we would love to hear from you about your thoughts on any of these hybrids, other fantasy hybrids you have that you've thought of that we didn't mention that you think could be really great. Um any bad experiences you've heard of or witnessed, uh, any of that. And if you know of access to anybody breeding any of these species specifically, because, again, these are all species that uh, one or both of us would like to fly, especially the peregrine kestrel hybrids. Yeah. yeah. I'd love that. Well, one more thing, one more little thing I want to try, and maybe this will get some traction, maybe it won't, but I thought it'd be kind of fun because uh, just like you're a heavy aviation nerd, um, my whole life, I've collected skulls and bones. I ran a museum for years. And sometimes it's just kind of fun to get your mind going. I love on Facebook to post like, hey, what skull is this? Or what bone is this? Or what fossil is this? And let people guess. So I'm going to try sharing a skull at the end of our podcast. And then you can, in the comments, put down what you think it is. And then at the end of next week's podcast, we would answer what it was and give you a new skull. And if it's stupid and nobody likes it, we'll get rid of it. But with that in mind, here is this week's skull. Okay. And I'm trying to put it in the camera. There we go. I'm trying to look at the screen and the camera. Okay. There you go. There's underneath. Wow. I'm not even a skull person. I think I might know what that is. You probably do. This isn't a hard one. Let me open the mouth there. It's pretty... I got to get used to this. It's my first time using this particular camera. Okay, so uh, there's no teeth, but okay, I'm gonna try just with that. I think you can see that. Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right, so let us know in the comments what you think that is, and we'll answer next week. Um, other than that, any other hybrids you want to talk about? No, I think that's it. All right. Well, you guys, again, everybody check out John's channel. I will make sure to put down that channel and uh, his uh, and your TikTok account. Yep. Yep. We'll get them both on there. Uh, be sure to check them out and catch us next week as, uh, on the uh, Falconry Podcast. And as always, happy hockey.